Hi, and welcome to Game & Read. This is episode one of our month-long series, The Chronicles of Nino Narnia, where we are pairing together the entire Chronicles of Narnia, all seven books, with the game Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch. So far, I've played about five hours of Nino Kuni. I have made it through the initial Motorville stuff. I went through Ding Dong Dell and the cats. I got through the magical forest, the gold one. Yep. Whatever, Forest <laughs> of Plenty, I think it's called, I don't know. I went through the desert, which was a pain in the ass to get to Al Mamoon, which is a dumb name. Um, and I made it through the trial of sages. Yep, the sages the trial. time trial. Temple, Temple of trials. Right, that thing. So I've done all that. The point I am currently getting ready to go off to Old Smoky, the volcano that apparently is erupting because someone dislodged its boulder. I don't know. So that's where I am. So far, I really enjoy the game. I think it's a lot of fun. I think that the storyline is really interesting. So you're Oliver and your mom has died and all of a sudden this toy stuffed animal that you've had forever comes to life. And is Mr. Drippy, again, dumb name, Mr. Drippy, the high lord of fairy lords. The lord high lord of the fairies. Whatever, he's a weirdo and he is Scottish. not very nice sometimes. Um, so he comes to life and is basically like, yo, there's another world. Let's go and defeat El and defeat Shadar and get your mom's soul back and... There's an evil genie there's an evil in this genie. other world named Shadar. He's basically right. messing up everybody, so, breaking their hearts and taking away their emotions. So I think it's an interesting storyline. I don't totally get the idea of soulmates quite yet. There's like everyone in each in the other world has a soulmate with someone in Motorville and uh, you have to sometimes go back and forth and deal with one person to get to the other person or want fix one soulmate to fix the other soulmate which is interesting I I'm still, I'm sure it comes into play more, especially since the whole point of Oliver going is to find his mom's soulmate to bring her back to life, blah, 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 whatever. So that's interesting. I think Oliver is a really cool protagonist. He is not obnoxious or annoying. He is curious and he doesn't always know what to do, but I, he hasn't gotten on my nerves. Yeah. Which I was kind of anticipating a child protagonist to be really annoying, and he's not. Uh, and then I also think that the art, animation, character design, all of that stuff is really beautiful and really adds uh, this layer to the game that I wasn't necessarily expecting. It makes it more engrossing because it's really well done. Yeah, it's a really fun game to just kind of be in, mm -hmm. even if you're not, you know, progressing the story too, too much at the time. It's just an enjoyable experience of being in that realm, that landscape. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any complaints thus far. That's good, because I really like it. It's kind of, <laughs> the controls um, during fighting are a little wonky. It's taken me a little time to get used to switching around between familiars and spells. And I just added Esther, the whitest girl in the desert, whose dad is not white. What the hell? Yeah, they, they, did, a, they did a weird... I wouldn't say it's a racial thing, because they don't really address it. But yeah, they are, you meet this guy who's a sage who's got... A very dark skin tone, and then he's got a blonde very, white daughter. A very pale daughter. They also live in a desert city where it is very right. sunny. So anyway, so anyway, I just got her in my party, so it's been a little confusing figuring out how to switch between the two kids and their familiars and their spells, and it's a little wonky. But overall, really fun. I am excited to keep playing and see what happens next. Nice. So, I have read two of the seven books of Narnia so far. I read the first two chronologically, which are The Magician's Nephew, which is 
a bit of a prequel because it was written towards the end. It was about the sixth how, book written. Yeah, it was the sixth book written, but it chronologically takes place before any of the siblings go to Narnia and wardrobe and all that. And it tells the story of the old professor man, Diggory, Professor Diggory Kirk, when he was a child and he saw the creation of Narnia. Additionally, I also read Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, the classic Narnia book that so many people have already read, myself included. And I'm going to start with Magician's Nephew. It's, it's an alright book. I remember liking it as a kid a lot. I thought it was really interesting, the traveling between worlds and the way they do it by going through, like, the wood between the worlds, which was kind of this intermediary plane that mm -hmm. connected all realms of existence, presumably. Which there are a lot of. Yes, presumably infinite, if you, you know, <laughs> believe in that kind of stuff or think that's how, you know, the universe and everything works. But I thought it was really cool. And then they go to one world, pick up, you know, Jadis, who becomes the evil white witch and accidentally bring her to the human world and then bring her to Narnia right as it's beginning. They meet Aslan as he's making everything in his godly, Jesus-y way. He's more godly at this point than Jesus-y. True, he's very Jesus-y in the next he's one. Jesus -y. He is Jesus-y in White Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe, but in, in um, a Magician's Nephew, he's definitely God. Yeah, he is creating stuff. Because he is creating. I don't think anybody reads, you know, the first stories of the Bible as Jesus was there making stuff. Some people Some do. people But do. that's another topic. But that, that's a big religious thing. <laughs> I'll write a paper Anyway, <laughs> it was, Magician's Nephew is a little dull. If you haven't read it, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It's kind of cool to be like, oh, yeah, it's got the cool prequel stuff where they're like, why is the light post there? They explain why the light post is there in the well, middle of Well, and you learn Narnia. why the wardrobe exists. Yes. And who is the owner of the wardrobe. Yeah, you learn and... more about Professor Diggory Kirk, who comes up in at least wardrobe, because I haven't read much past that yet. And it, it's interesting for that, but like the actions are very kind of blah. So Diggory Kirk, he's like a 10 year old boy. He's got this friend Polly who goes on the adventure with him and his uncle creates these rings that transport them to the wood between the world. So the villains are kind of the uncle and then Jadis, the queen. Mm -hmm. And the, the kids don't do a ton in general. Like they're very passive. They get kind of forced into going there by the uncle and then you know, accidentally bring the queen along with them, and they don't do... There's not a lot of action. Like, he goes on one little quest for Aslan, it's pretty dull. And then Aslan, I mean, Aslan, like, tells him what to do. Yeah. He doesn't even have to fight anything. Yeah, I feel like by the end of the series of books, when this was first published, C.S. Lewis might have been a slightly more interested in going into some slightly more biblical elements of... Narnia, whereas Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, yeah, there was a the whole Jesus resurrection thing, but in this, it's pretty much just a creation story. There's even an Adam and Eve trope where Diggory basically plays the role of Eve, being tempted mm -hmm. by knowledge and then causing evil to come into the world through Jadis, the evil queen. And it's just not great. I'd give it probably a, a three. Uh, it's not as good as Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is the other one I read, reread it. Still good, still interesting. There's actually some action where, you know, Peter gets to like brandish a sword and fight some wolves and stuff. So it, it's much more exciting. And there's in more side characters. You have Tumnus, you have Aslan, you have the four siblings instead of just a couple of kids. And they're all a little different, even if they don't get super in depth with every single one of them. And yeah, it's just better. So for the pairing that we're doing this week, since we have to pair them together piecemeal over the next this week plus three more, we are going to focus on certain topics each week. This week we're focusing on the landscape, the child protagonists, and the method by which you were transported from world to world, since both the game and the books involve going from normal human world, crazy fantasy world. <laughs> so first thing we're gonna talk about is the landscape, the worlds we have in there. And I'm really interested in fantasy landscapes. I have been since Lord of the Rings, the movies came out and I got interested in Tolkien and all that. And I loved the maps that were in all the books like The Hobbit. And it was just like, oh wow, there's so much detail in what can happen here. Even if you don't go to these places, you're super interested in what goes on up there, what's over there, and the geography of it. And both of these 
pieces of art have I don't say their maps are as good as Tolkien's or anything like that, but they're interesting and they're actually very similar. So Narnia, you've got this, we'll throw it up there on the side, it's this <laughs> map that is clearly like one half of a continent. You never really go past, you know, to the, I think it's the west very far, whichever direction that is, west, yeah that's west. Anyway, you don't go very far over there, they don't even reference it, but it looks like land must continue, so... I don't know what's going on with all that. And same with Nino Kuni, you've got these couple of continents and some islands, but obviously that's not an entire planet. So presumably there's land elsewhere, but they don't really deal with that. So they've got kind of this localized geographic area and there's lots of interesting stuff in there. There's deserts, there's mountains, all very stratified by whatever region you're in. And they're also a little simplistic overall. There would never just be a single city and then fields. That's not how anything works. There has to be towns and mines and farms. Doesn't matter in a fantasy world because it's fantasy. So those two have a lot in common in that context. And I think it adds to the similar idea of these and the pairing overall. The other part about the landscape and the setting that is really interesting is that both Nino Kuni and the Chronicles of Narnia have a plethora of non-human creatures yep. that are very important and integral characters to this story. So in uh, The Magician's Nephew, Aslan creates animals, right? And some of them can talk and some of them can't, but the ones that can talk are talking and they yeah. are Beavers, making decisions horses. and they're, you know, sentient, rational creatures that are non-human. And then in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we see that really clearly in things like Tumnus. Tumnus is not a human. He's, he's human-like, but he is not a human and he's a really important character. The beavers mm -hmm. are distinctly non-human, but play a really important part in the story. And they act in very human ways. They have a house, they cook, they fish, they do all these things that humans do. Yeah. Likewise, in Nino Kuni, there are so many non-human creatures that cat come people. into play, right? The first city you go to, Ding Dong Dell, is inhabited by cat people. And humans, but I also mean, humans cat too, but like the king is a cat. Yeah. Uh, you have familiars, which don't talk but are non-human creatures that are really important to your success. You have Mr. Drippy, who's, who's a, fairy. a fairy, and also yeah, weird Fairies are shit. weird looking in Nino Kuni. So that is an important part of both landscapes, the bigger idea of landscape, yeah. and that there are all these sentient non-human creatures that aid on the journey and also uh, present challenges to the journey. So the next topic we want to cover this week is the traveling between the worlds. In Narnia, traveling between the human world and Narnia is so passive. It's like Diggory and Polly touch the uncle rings that takes them to yep. the wood between the worlds and then, and then to Narnia, right? But they have no idea what they're doing. They just, and in the line the witch in the wardrobe, they literally stumble into the wardrobe into Narnia. And they can't even do it consistently. And they can't even do it consistently. And so it's a really passive mode of getting between one world to the other. Whereas in Ni no Kuni, it is very deliberately an action. Oliver has to cast a spell to get him from Motorville to the other world. Uh, or back and he has to make the conscious decision to do that. He has to have the wand, he has to have the spell, he has to make that decision. Whereas in the Chronicles of Narnia, that decision is a much more passive and happenstance kind of decision. Yeah, I mean, I'm in full agreement with that, I think the method of traveling is much more interesting overall in Nino Kuni, although I guess there is kind of that mysterious magic that can play around in Narnia that would make it a more, I mean, we're not competing the two things right. together, <laughs> but 
I would say I prefer the Nino Cooney method where he's like, I am a citizen of two worlds now. I will go back and forth when I need to. Mm -hmm. And that is my control. Whereas Narnia, it's like, let's go have a weird adventure, grow old, and then come back and be kids again. That's a little strange. That's the other part of the travel between that's really different is that Nino Cooney, they don't say it, but we're assuming that it's the, the times they're, are they're at the same connected, pace. Right? We know they're we've connected. Got soulmates. Right. And everything seems to happen at the same time. Whereas in Narnia, we've got the whole thing where it, you know, you come back and it's pretty much the same instant when you left. So the final thing we're pairing together with these two pieces are the child protagonists. They both utilize kid protagonists, you know, they're well under adulthood. I think the oldest of the siblings in Narnia like are like 16. 14, maybe 16, but they're, they're all young. And we think that's an interesting take overall. It's obviously, you know, Narnia are kids books, so kid protagonists make the most sense. Nino Cooney kind of runs that line of it's definitely enjoyable for adults, but it's also open to kids. So a child protagonist isn't too out of line either way but they're all distinctly children and a lot of the challenges they face, especially internally, are very childlike. I do make the argument that Oliver is a way more interesting child protagonist than any of the characters in the first two books of the Chronicles of Narnia. I think his drive for his mission is much more interesting. Uh, he is motivated by his mother's death and Mr. Drippy coming alive and the general evilness of Shadar, the dark genie in the other world. And he is ready to go. And even when he faces challenges, he continues to persevere. Whereas the four children in Narnia stumble upon Narnia. They get onto this mission by happenstance. And I mean, later they make the choice to stay and be the kings and queens, but that's not at all the intention at the beginning. Uh, they're, they don't know what they're doing. And I also think that Oliver is a much more personality driven character as well. I think we get to see aspects of Oliver's personality, whereas we don't really see or learn much about Diggory, Polly, or any of the four kids. We know kind of superficial things, but nothing really interesting about them. Now here's a point where I disagreed some with Aaron. I would say Oliver is a better individual character than anyone as far as they've gone in these two books. I know the, the siblings come in later during those books and maybe you can kind of build on what you already know about them. But just in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think having four different child archetypes in there is very helpful in kind of getting a a wider view of a childhood character even if it's through multiple different eyes you've got lucy who's the young one who first goes through she's you know she loves tumness she's just a very pleasant nice child well behaved and a younger kid that kind of level you've got edmund who's the one who betrays them to the white witch and he's we all know kids like this. They're just kind of little assholes. It happens. They're not necessarily going to be bad people forever, but you know, they can just be real jerks and selfish sometimes because they're children. Then you've got Susan, who's very much kind of the older sister. She takes care of Lucy. She's kind of the peacekeeper overall. She's very responsible yeah, and practical. Yeah, she tells Peter to stop messing with Edmund when mm -hmm. Peter's being too stern. She's kind of like the mom sibling which, you know, gender stereotypes as you will, but I've known plenty of people in my life who can kind of fill that role. And then you've got Peter, who, even though he has my namesake, I find him a little too, he's too righteous to a fault, where he can always criticize Edmund because Edmund actually has a fault and Peter's the older brother who's stronger, smarter, whatever else. So he's good in that sense, but at the same time, he can come down as very harsh on his younger siblings and very much fall into that I'm the oldest boy so I get to be bossy kind of thing. That's not just oldest boys. Fair enough. Aaron's an oldest girl and she's like that too. Anyway. Not ri <laughs> too righteous. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I think there's a more interesting diversity of childhood character in Narnia even if we don't get to know each one as well as we get to know Oliver. Fair. That's my thought. Anyway. I think that's all we have for you today. 
So you can check out our next video next Monday on these same topics, but with new books, new gameplay put in there. And you can check out GameAndRead.com for all of our other posts, videos, anything else you're looking for. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. I am at Emerge. And I'm at Nerd in the World. We'll see you next time.